Okay, the Mesilu Sharm began with a very broad understanding of life. And he explained to us that when Hashem created Adam, and Hashem created the human, Hashem created the human specifically to give of His good to man. The reason why Hashem created the entire cosmos, the earth, the planets, and everything is for man. And the reason Hashem made man was so that man should be zocha, should merit enjoying closeness, enjoying a proximity to Hashem, which is the greatest joy, the greatest enjoyment that a human being can have. However, Hashem decreed that man should work for his reward, and this world is the place where a person works. We once gave the mushal of a gym and a spa. The gym is a place where you work out, where you get in shape. The spa is a place where you enjoy. This world is a place where a person grows and a person accomplishes, and when he leaves his current status, when I leave the body, I will for eternity enjoy whatever level of perfection, of greatness that I reach, and forever I will be in that state. Now, Mesut Sharm then deals with a very pointed question, and that is, if there is a part of me that clearly understands that, and if in fact Hashem created the whole world specifically for me to grow, then it should be rather easy for the human being to do exactly that. Meaning, if I understand that every action that I engage in, every conversation, every thought, either shapes me into a better person or damages me for eternity, then isn't it obvious that everybody should spend their entire life just doing what's right, what's proper, what's appropriate. All of us should be great tzaddikim. There should be no such concept as sin. And in reality, the whole concept of yetzer tov, yetzer anything with sort of a dichotomy, any challenges, any, any of the normal situation shouldn't exist. However, Mr. Hashem explains that that wasn't the way Hashem wanted it to be. The way Hashem created the world was by placing man in a place that there are many, many things that take a person away from Hashem. Many, many things that make it difficult for a person to see Hashem. Many things that make it difficult for a person to experience Hashem. And it is far easier to do what's wrong than it is to do what's right. And I'd like to spend a few minutes this evening sort of going into a different I would say a different thought process because the Chovos Olvolos uses a different sort of set of almost parables or a way of, of sort of a viewpoint to view the human very differently than the Mr. Sharm. Now they're both in the same wavelength but he uses a different approach and I would like to spend a few minutes this evening explaining that. The Chovos Olvolos explains that when Hashem created the human Hashem took two opposite elements. <clears throat> Part of me only wants to be close to Hashem Part of me only wants to daven, only wants to do what's good, what's proper, what's right. And part of me couldn't care less. There's a full half of me that doesn't recognize Hashem. There's a full half of me that couldn't care about any other human being on the planet. There's a full half of me that only knows my own interests, my own desires. And that, he says, is something called the Nefesh HaBahami. And if you'd like to understand the human, the Chavaz of explains that you have to understand there are two distinct parts of the I who I'm speaking to you. I, the one who thinks, I, the one who feels, have a part of me that is pure, that is pure seichel, and that only wants to do what's good, what's right, what's proper. And there's another full half of me that's pure nefesh abahami, pure animal instincts. And if you'd like to understand the human, and that means you and I, all you have to do is go into the animal kingdom, and whatever you see as the nefesh in the animal, the soul, so to speak, in the animal, take that and you could parallel that back into the human and you'll understand half of the person. Now this concept that an animal has a nefesh, a lot of people don't hear that simply. And it takes a little while to adjust to it, but if you think about it, an animal is alive. An animal has a, a vibrancy to it, has an existence. A dog almost has a personality. We had a fellow in, in high school, it was a dorm yeshiva, and he came in ninth grade, and apparently it was very rough on his dog because his parents had bought him this dog when he was a little boy and the dog was a puppy and they grew up together and it was a very rough experience on the dog when his master went off to high school and now separated for months on end and this fellow explained that when he would go home for an out job he had a very difficult time because he would get off the bus his dog would run out to meet him and his dog would be so excited to see his master the dog would run over and the dog would relieve himself on his 
pants of his master because he was so excited that his master came home. But you see, the dog has an element to it that's alive, that sort of has not quite feelings, not quite emotions, but there's a nefesh, there's a live part to it, there's a vibrancy, there's a nefesh to the dog. And if you study every part of the wild kingdom, you'll see every one of them have a nefesh, they have a live part to them, they have a various, what you'd call a set of instincts, inclinations, and desires that keep them in existence. And as a matter of fact, the nefesh of the animal is very fine-tuned, very well-developed, to keep it alive. There's no seichel, there's no intellect, there's no understanding in the animal, but there are instincts. The robin instinctively hungers for the worm. The robin does not sit back there and say, hmm, based on my nutritional needs as well as general availability, I believe I'm going to eat the earthworm. It doesn't have any cognition anywhere near that sort. It hungers intuitively, instinctively for the worm. The cat instinctively desires the mouse. It has the claws, it has the instinct, it has the teeth to hunt down the mouse and capture it. And Hashem put into every animal in the wild kingdom all of the desires, needs, and inclinations for its survival. Two bullfrogs do not sit down and say, hmm, I think it's time we settle down and raise a family. There are instincts, there are drives. All of the wild kingdom continue in their existence they're able to survive both as an individual <coughs> and as a species because Hashem put in all of the drives, all of the inclinations into them to survive. And oftentimes it's amazing to see. There was an article in National Geographic about a few biologists who had discovered cubs. <coughs> These were Siberian tiger cubs that had been orphaned at birth. Their mother had been killed and the biologists took them in and began raising them on bottled milk. There was no other way to keep them alive. So they raised them from the time they were little cubs until they actually grew into full-sized Siberian tigers. And then they had the dilemma, how could they continue to feed them? On the other hand, they couldn't release them into the wild. There was no mother to teach them how to stalk, how to hunt down the prey, what to eat. Without any choice, what the biologists decided to do was they just released them and they studied them. And they said from the minute these Siberian tigers were released in the wild, instinctively they knew to hunt the deer, they knew how to stalk, they knew how to jump, they knew exactly how to kill it, and they knew exactly which part to eat first. Instinctively, within the nefesh of the Siberian tiger, are all of the instincts, needs, and desire to keep it alive. So too Hashem put all of the instincts into all of the animal kingdom, and so too, the Chavaz of Avos explains, Hashem put into the human. Within each human being, there are all of the desires, <coughs> instincts, and drives to keep both the individual alive and the species as a whole. And if you would like to understand the human, all you have to do is go into the wild, study the nefesh of the behema, and then just understand that it's fully half of me functioning <coughs> and acting right here. Now, if you're not quite sure what I'm referring to, I'll share with you something that I find very, very telling. When my wife had our first child, she went on something that I call the SIT diet. Now, I don't know if anyone knows what the SIT diet is, but the SIT diet is, uh, it's actually an acronym. It stands for, anyone know? SIT diet? No, it's not, not Atkins. It's not, uh, no, it stands for SIT, self inflicted torture diet. Here's how it goes. You take a big wedge of chocolate cake, a Diet Coke, and you say these words, I'm so fat, I'm so fat, I'm so fat. You continue to eat the full slice of the chocolate cake, drink the Diet Coke, and you are now on the sit diet, self-inflicted torture. I said to my wife then, I said, listen, I, I have no real mukpada here. If you want to be thin, that's great. You want to be heavy, that's great. That's up to you. But there's no sit diet. There's no self-inflicted diet. If you're really, really bent on losing weight, then you're gonna, we're going to go to Weight Watchers. And she said, no, 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 no. Bottom line is, I took my wife to Weight Watchers. And you have to appreciate that, number one, I was the only guy in the audience. That was the first unusual thing. It was in the middle of the day. <clears throat> I took off, and I specifically made it my point to be there. Now, here was the first observation that I really, really understood clearly. I don't know if you appreciate this, but
but for women, being thin is a big deal. Now, these were women who were clearly not thin and clearly bothered by the fact that they weren't thin, otherwise they wouldn't have been there. And this is sort of how the meeting went. They're all sitting there. Now, these are mature adults who were reasonably put together, and the leader gets up and says something like, okay, ladies, somebody tell me what challenges you had this week. One woman begins, well, I was doing real great until somebody brought out a bag of potato chips. Another one goes, oh, potato chips, oh, yeah, I know, no. Another one says, I was doing so great on my diet until somebody brought out chocolate. Oh, chocolate, oh, no, chocolate, chocolate. Ladies, ladies, get it together. Potato chips, chocolate, chocolate cake, oh, ice cream, oh, no, ice cream, I know. They were losing it right in front of my eyes, and they were losing it. And what I came to recognize is a very interesting phenomena in the human. You see, when that piece of chocolate cake is here, there are two voices within me. There's a voice within me that says, I do not want to eat that chocolate cake. There's another voice that says, yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I do. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no. What are you, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? What are you, so confused? You don't know what your, your mind is thinking? But the answer is, there are two distinct parts of me. There's a part of me that really does not want to eat that chocolate cake. But there's another part of me that does. And if you'd like to understand the human, that is the assode. The assode of the human is that there are two different dimensions. There are two different parts. Now, dieting is not really a big deal. But this concept applies to everything we do in life. There are always various, various parts and things going on within us. There are drives, inclinations, desires that just pull at us, that want to do things. And there's another part of me that says, I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want this. And if you'd like to understand the human, you have to understand that the human is in constant, constant battle. The Chavaz of all this point is, he says, that the nefesh bahami and the nefesh sikhli, the behemoth, the instinctive drives, and the pure part of the Shema are in constant battle for primacy of the human. Each one is fighting for control of me. The more I give into the behemoth, the stronger it becomes, the weaker the seichel becomes, the more it governs and the more controls. And the flip side, the more that I give into the seichel and control the behemoth, the weaker it becomes, the stronger the seichel becomes. But the I whom I'm speaking to and constantly am, am in flux, one or the other is always being nizgaber, is always winning out and being victorious. And when you understand this, the Chavaz says, you'll quickly understand that the human is destined to fail. Because if you think about the following, whatever we do in life strengthens one or the other. Much like a muscle, the more you use it, the stronger it becomes. And if you, with disuse, it atrophies. So too the seichel. The more you use it, the stronger it becomes. The less you use it, the weaker it becomes. The Chavazal explains that everything we do all day long strengthens the Nefesh Bahami. All day long we're pursuing this world's interests, needs, hungers, appetites, desires of this world. All day long we are strengthening the Nefesh Bahami. What's strengthening the Nefesh Sikhli? The answer is very, very little. And therefore he explains that the Torah gives us very specific mitzvahs to strengthen the Nefesh Sikhli. Chesed, when I give to somebody else, is a tremendous conquering of the Nefesh Bahami. You see, the bear can only take care of its own needs. It only knows its own needs and can only take care of its own needs. And even when you hear of a mother bear giving up its life for its cubs, it's not because it's altruistic, not because it's magnanimous, it's because instinctively within the nature of the bear is a desire to take care of the child. They've studied baboons. Mother baboons will coddle their baby, take care of the baby, long after the baby's dead. They find baboons. The child died two days ago, but the baboon is spaced out, is unaware, and will continue coddling and holding the baby because that's the instinct of the animal. There's no seichel, there's no intelligence, there's no das, there's no wisdom in the animal. There's instincts, there's drives and desires. When a human says, I'm not going to take care of my needs, I'm going to place someone else's needs first, what that person is doing is shutting down the nefesh bahami. And that's pure nefesh sikhli. There are various activities that strengthen nefesh sikhli. Those are the mitzvahs that Hashem gave us, learning Torah, <coughs> chesed, all of the various activities that we do strengthen 
the mitzvahs that we do strengthen the nefesh sikhli, and the physical activities that we do during the day strengthen the nefesh bahami. And with that, the Chavaz of Allah says, there's a tremendous insight into many, many mitzvahs. The Gemara tells us that treif food is metamtem halev. Treif food deadens the heart. Meaning to say, if you eat a cheeseburger, you're just not going to be able to dive in the same way, you're not going to feel Shabbos the same way. I've had many experiences with secular Jews, and I could tell you immediately whether the person eats treif or not. And it's, it's oftentimes just obvious, if you try to speak to them about certain concepts, you can tell there's a blockage in the heart. Now, the Chobos of Olives explains why this works. He says, because these two dimensions of me are battling. Because of that, Hashem warns us against certain foods and certain activities that give an inordinate edge to the Nefesh HaBahami. He explains, tray food <coughs> strengthens the Nefesh HaBahami. Shatnis, wearing wool and linen together, strengthens the Nefesh HaBahami. Now, those mitzvahs that are called a chok, he says, they're not a chok in the sense that why Hashem warns us. Hashem tells us not to do it because they give an unnatural edge to the Nefesh Bahami. To really understand how that functions, you have to be a scientist of the soul, and in that sense, it's a chok. Why is it that meat with, cooked with milk gives an unnatural edge, whereas the meat, meat is fine, the milk is fine, together it's not fine? And that, the Chavaz of Allah explains, you have to be a tremendous chacham of Shlomo HaMelech's proportions to understand. But the bottom line is that this combination is damaging, therefore the Torah warns me not to do it. When you understand this concept, I think you're able to understand a lot of what the Torah warns us against, and explains to us, because the reality is that the I am in constant battle. Throughout my life, there's a challenge. Throughout my life, there are two <coughs> voices, two forces. And throughout my life, one or the other is gaining primacy. If you would like to understand the human, you have to understand this. Unfortunately, <coughs> you read about it more and more commonly. You will read about governors who do the f- most foolish things. <coughs> you read about heads of state who give away their entire career, and you scratch your head and go, what was he thinking? But you see, my friends, that's exactly the point. He wasn't thinking. He was much like that woman at the Weight Watchers meeting, describing what it was like when somebody brought out pistachio ice cream. Oh, my favorite lady, you don't want to eat it. Just don't eat it. What's the problem? Well, I don't want to eat it, but... I do want to eat it, but I don't, but I do, but I don't, but I do. And that is the I. Each person has their own area of the fight, but that fight is the essence, that fight is the growth, that fight is the purpose for creation, and that's what we're doing here. And when you understand the two parts, and when you understand the balance, and when you understand that there are certain activities that the Torah specifically warns us against because they give an unnatural edge to Nefesh Bahami, you begin to understand much more deeply how the UNI functions. And let me mention one more point that I think begs understanding. Shortly we're coming up to Yom Kippur. Now, Yom Kippur is what we'd call certainly the most probably the most productive day of the year. It's a day when Hashem is most close. It's a day when a person can do tshuva. It's a day where a person can feel things and think things that they can't during the rest of the year. Now, wouldn't you assume that the Torah would say, on a day like Yom Kippur, make sure you eat a good breakfast? I mean, get you're going to have a long day in shul. <clears throat> make sure you sit down to a very hearty meal, make sure you have the energy, the strength, the vigor to get out there and do tshuva, and to really talk to Hashem. Don't forget, this is Yom Kippur. This is the day that's primed for your progress. And yet, that's not quite what we do on Yom Kippur. And you have to ask yourself, gee golly, why? So the answer is, well, because you should be weak. (laughs) But that kind of sounds dumb. If this is the greatest day of the year, shouldn't I be strong? And if you look in the Sefer Chinuch, he explains very clearly why it is that the Torah forbids us from eating. He says it's exactly this point. When you eat, your nefesh abahami is strong. And as a matter of fact, when you walk into Kol Nidre in the beginning of the, of the fast, it's very difficult to really feel contrite, to feel broken. It's very difficult to really feel Hashem. But when you get up in the morning and the day starts wearing on, 
and you start getting weaker, somewhere around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, there's a certain weakening of the nefesh abahami. <clears throat> Your physical soul starts weakening, and it's now easier for you to experience things. It's easier for you to understand things. <clears throat> it's easier for you to relate to concepts. It's easier for you to feel Hashem's presence. And it's at that point that you can really begin doing tshuva. It's at that point that you can really start using the day properly. Granted, we're not as strong, but that part that's not as strong is the nefesh bahami. The <clears throat> nefesh sikhli is much more powerful. And I think that's exactly Mr. Shalom's point. He says, Hashem places us in a place where there are many, many things that take us away from Hashem. Many, many things. My entire nature, half of me, <clears throat> demands that Hashem doesn't exist. Half of me demands that you don't exist. I couldn't care about you. I don't care about anyone. And there's another half of me. There's another half of me that only wants to do what's right and what's proper to serve Hashem properly. And I am in constant battle. Which one <clears throat> I give into determines who I am for eternity because I'm constantly shaping myself, I'm constantly molding myself and forever I will be exactly what I made myself into during my short career here. I think these concepts are very, very deep and both the concept that in general there's a stira within the human, a contradiction within the human and particularly the fact that there's a constant change within me based on what I do is very, very basic. By the way, why is it that learning is so central in Judaism? Meaning to say, from the time a boy is seven years old, he's told the center of your religious experience is limit Torah, is learning, learning, learning. You have to ask yourself at some point, gee golly, why? Why is it so significant? Why is it so important? And the Chovos of Others explains that that's exactly the point. The greatest spiritual nourishment for the soul, the rocket fuel for the neshama, is learning. There's no other activity on the face of the planet that gives such nourishment to the neshama as does learning. Those are Hashem's words. Those are phenomenally deep concepts. And when the neshama ingests them, it changes the eye. The behema gets no hana, no pleasure whatsoever from it. And the nefesh sikhli the seichel, does. Let me close with one last point, and then I'll gladly take questions. My son, Shalom Aryeh, when he was a little guy, used to read Animorphs. Now, I don't know if any of you know what Animorphs are, but it's a science fiction book. And in it, there's a creature called a yerk. A yerk is a little slug, about yay big. And the yerk will climb up your body, go into your ear, and take over your brain. And basically, you want to go left, but the yerk says, uh uh, we're going right. You want to go back, the yerk says, uh uh, we're going forward. And the yerk takes over, and you become a <coughs> puppet because the yerk now controls you from inside. So my son, this little guy, said to me, Ah, but look at that, isn't it a great muscle to the Yet Sahara? <coughs> you want to do this, but the Yet Sahara says, No, do that. <coughs> you want to go forward, he says, Back, isn't it a great muscle? Now, at the time he was a little guy, so I said, Yes, 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 it's a great muscle. But I want to share with you something that that's a horrible muscle. It's a terrible muscle. I'll explain to you why. <clears throat> you see, at the end of the day, when I'm faced with a challenge, with an assignment, and there are two competing voices within me. I want to, I don't want to, I do, I don't, and then I give in. It's I who now want it. I have given in, and it's not like somebody inside my brain is making me do it. It's now I have accepted that as what I want, and I've changed. You see, we'll do it with the chocolate cake. If I said I don't want, I do want, I do, and I now sit down to eat it, it's I'm eating it. And I've now accepted that, and I am now beginning to change. Now again, dieting is not greatly significant in your perfection as a human, but as a muscle it is, because when I give in to the Yitzhahara, then I become different, and the opposite, if I resist and I give in only <coughs> to my seichel, to my intellect, then I have changed, I become a different person. And this concept is very, very different than the way we typically understand.